Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. We are delighted to welcome you to the latest FS Club webinar, Crypto Asset Regulation, an International Survey and Key Developments. And uh, we're joined here by an extraordinarily knowledgeable speaker uh, in this space, Usman Sheikh, who is one of the uh, key legal experts, having been both regulator and advisor in this space. I must also thank our sponsors um, who uh, have brought this webinar to you. Uh, and my name is Hugh Morris. I'm a senior research partner here at Zien. But thanks to our sponsors, because with them, we are able to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. So my job is to get out of the way as fast as possible. And we have a very simple agenda uh, my uh, introduction will be quickly over, followed by the real meat of the session from Usman Sheikh. Uh, following that, we will have about 25 minutes of questions and answers. And if you would please care to uh, use the chat facility to send in your questions, uh, then uh, I can uh, moderate those and uh, we can engage with Usman after uh, he has finished delivering his words of wisdom. So with no further ado, I will hand over to Usman. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. And I'm assuming that everyone can see the title page now. OK, so today is the uh, presentation on crypto asset regulation and really key developments. I'm delighted to be able to be here uh, with all of you today. I'm a partner at Gowling WLG. I'm based in our Toronto office, but we have locations all around the world. Um, our agenda for today is quite aggressive, as um, uh, has been noted. So uh, let's get right to it. So what I thought I would do is just level set a little bit and uh, make sure we're on the same page and give a little bit of a primer with respect to blockchain technology. So what is blockchain technology? I've got a few quotes up on the slide here. Some have said that this technology is one of the most revolutionary, if not evolutionary technologies to have been invented since the days of the internet. You'll see a few quotes, as I mentioned, up on your screen. One is from Blythe Masters. She's one of the co-inventors of the credit default swap and a key pioneer in the blockchain space. She says, you should be taking this technology as seriously as you should have been taking the development of the internet in the early 1990s. And then a very famous leading book called Blockchain Revolution um, noted that the technology likely to have the greatest impact on the financial services industry in the world of business has arrived. And then a rep from IBM noted that many banks and others are doing an extensive amount of POCs in this area. And as counsel, I can basically confirm that a number of quite very fascinating projects are going on in this area. So what is the technology? Um, there's a lot of very complicated, convoluted, complex definitions out there. Um, what I usually tell people is that the technology at its core again, at its core is really nothing more or nothing less than a ledger. It's a digital ledger or a database of transactions. And in fact, another word by which blockchain will go by is DLT or distributed ledger technology, although the two terms are not exactly synonymous. So many of you may be scratching your head wondering, what's all the fuss about in the media and so much interest over a ledger of all things? Well, you have to consider how important a ledger is in your life. So think of a normal bank transaction. And let's say John wanted to send 50 bucks to uh, Samantha. What John would do is go to his bank. They would check his debits and credits, his ledger, and see where he's ended up. And then a message would go to a correspondent bank and then onto Samantha's bank. And everyone would update their respective ledgers. That same form of transaction really occurs in many, many, many other aspects of our life. Think of a stock transaction, think of a real estate transaction. Now, a very silent, but very present common denominator in every one of those traditional transactions that I just mentioned is the presence of a trusted third party intermediary. So the user doesn't really maintain their own ledger. We don't really trust John to say he has 50 bucks in his account. 
we trust his bank. They're the single source of truth. And this is especially required for digital transactions because of a problem that is widely known as the problem of double spend, which is, is that if we trusted John to say he has $5 or $50 on his phone digitally, and he wants to send that money, he can just send that money, but uh, having taken a copy of it, send a copy of it to somebody else and a copy of it to somebody else. And so we're basically double or triple spending which is why we have a whole industry of now intermediaries behind the scenes to confirm that he is not doing that. So why is this ledger so unique? Why is blockchain technology so unique? This ledger somehow in some fashion has come up with a way to maintain a ledger that allows transactions to occur without going through these trusted or a trusted third party intermediary a bank, a stock exchange, et cetera, et cetera. Trust does not reside in a single or any particular trusted third party intermediary. Trust is in mathematics and cryptographic proof. And so instead of <clears throat> a master ledger in blockchain technology being held by a central party, which is really the picture and the diagram to the very left hand side of your screen, which is really our traditional system, in fact, this ledger is maintained by many, many people around the world, and it's a very different structure. And so when you go back to Satoshi Nakamoto's uh, original white paper, what really started this all off, and I'm not sure if you can read that or not, but this is the very first page. This is the abstract. This is the very top of the very first page. You can see what his, her, their mission is, because we really don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto is which is to create a peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash that would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution, without going through and having to place one's trust in a trusted third-party intermediary. So I'm not going to go through how it achieve, achieves that and the technical details that's beyond the scope of a 20-minute discussion, but I'll just say that one of the key revolutionary aspects of this technology is what we call the ability to disintermediate, the ability to basically remove the intermediary, that trusted third party, from our everyday transactions. And so you see a few quotes, one from the World Economic Forum here saying that the blockchain protocol threatens to disintermediate almost every process in financial services. Um, so with that background, what you should also know is, is that a whole industry has now been created based on the development of public blockchains. Uh, you can see layer one technology like Bitcoin, there's Polkadot noted, there's many, many other major players now that have emerged in this industry, whether they're custodians or mining companies or marketplaces or crypto asset managers, and we'll come back to some of these in a moment. And we see retailers now accepting crypto assets like Bitcoin and others based on these public ledgers. And we've seen a significant rise in popularity. Um, I've seen this happen two times. One was back in 2017, 2016 with the boom of ICOs. But the recent rise in pop, uh, popularity is for the very factors that are listed on your screen. One is that the price of Bitcoin has gone up significantly. Uh, this is a little bit stale dated, but back in 2019, it uh, sold for about 3,000 USD per Bitcoin. And it spiked uh, sometime this year to about 70,000 USD. And so there's a lot of interest in, in getting into this area. You can also see on the top right hand corner, that's Beeple's artwork. That was an NFT that was sold for almost 69 million USD. You can see a headline from uh, the New York Times, which notes that China is also creating a digital currency based on blockchain technology. So what's called a CBDC or central bank digital currency. And we've also been hearing and there's been a lot of fascination around a concept called DeFi or decentralized finance, where you're effectively offering bank like products and other securities type products without any of the intermediaries involved. So I thought I would just start off with that background um, before we dive into some of the issues. What I wanted to focus on, if I may, are really just two 
areas of regulatory concern that we have seen and how the regulators have been responding. And I'm not planning to cover the entire world because again, in a 20 minute presentation, it's a little bit difficult to do that. I thought I would use Canada as an example, along with the United States, give you a sense as to how things are being dealt with in North America, along with some reference to some international developments as well. So on the securities front, what we've really seen are responses from our regulators being lumped into five different bu buckets. We've seen a lot of regulatory warnings being issued and guidance pieces. We've seen the development of these things called regulatory sandboxes. We've seen regulatory studies. We've seen some new statutory and rulemaking because regulators and legislators have recognized that our existing laws really didn't really contemplate something like this technology. We've also been seeing uh, litigation and enforcement action. So I thought I'd touch upon very briefly each one of those. On the regulatory war warnings and guidance piece uh, or guidance uh, portion, um, these are just a few examples of regulatory guidance that has been issued in Canada by our securities regulators. What's interesting to note here, at least from my perspective, is, is that the first guidance was in March of 2017. The Bitcoin white paper was released in October, basically Halloween, so October 31st of 2008. So you can see the regulators coming to the, to the scene, if you will, many, many years later. And by then, and again, I don't mean this in any negative way, because this just happens to be the way innovation oftentimes works, fortunately or unfortunately. But you could probably imagine that many projects were already up and running and very, very active before our regulators issued that first guidance, which was just a short news release, maybe about half a page long, just telling parties that one should be mindful that securities laws may apply. Since that time, they've issued a number of other guidance pieces in different areas. So you can see by the headings, some relate to cryptocurrency offerings or ICOs, some relate to what are called crypto asset trading platforms, which is our word for crypto exchanges. The more commonly used word is crypto exchanges, but we use the word crypto asset trading platforms because an exchange is a very defined thing in Canada. It's like the Toronto Stock Exchange or the New York Stock Exchange, which these things are not. Um, and so a lot of guidance has been issued in Canada. The same is true in the United States. Um, in, in fact, frankly, I haven't, uh, I'm a former prosecutor at the Ontario Securities Commission. I haven't seen an area that has received as much attention, as much frequent at attention as the crypto asset industry uh, within the past few years. I mean, this is quite extraordinary to see how many pieces, guidance pieces, warnings have been issued in this area. But I'll just say that one of the key things that we've been seeing are regulatory warnings and guidance. Um, I've just sort of summarized the position in Canada. Um, we have, our regulators have spoken to the issue of ICOs or initial coin offerings. Uh, this is effectively, for those of you who are unaware, um, the distribution of tokens to people in the public that very much look like a distribution of securities. It's almost a capital raising event for, for many companies, not always, but many companies. And what our securities regulators in Canada, and well, I would say North America have generally said, is, is that if you satisfy what's called the investment contract test, you will be deemed a security. And so in the United States, you may have heard of the Howey test. In Canada, our Supreme Court adopted the Howey test, which was issued by the Supreme Court of the United States. And in, in, in our Supreme Court did that in a case called Pacific Coin. So we call it the Pacific Coast Coin Test. But it's very much the same thing, which is testing for whether the token is an investment contract, which then by definition makes it a security. And you therefore have to comply with all the securities laws that uh, some of which are highlighted in the next bullet. So prospectus requirements and so on and so forth. Our regulators have also issued guidance regarding crypto asset trading platforms and crypto funds. And I'll hand around these slides later on, but <clears throat> we'll come back to these points in a moment. Another thing that we've seen is a development of regulatory sandboxes. And I know that the United Kingdom has one as well with the UK FCA. Um, ours, our main, one of our main ones is the OSC Launchpad. They're intended to be an opportunity to welcome in blockchain businesses and dialogue with them, see if they may need some relief from our traditional securities laws 
and they will then move forward with an exemptive relief application and OSC Launchpad is intended to be there to help them with that. The SEC really has something similar called SEC FinHub. I wanted to just give you an example of the number of exemptive relief applications in the blockchain space that have been granted. Uh, some relate to initial coin offerings, some relate to exempt market dealers, which are a type of registrant in Canada. Some relate to crypto asset trading platforms, all to say that this is one way that our regulators have reacted to this new thing called blockchain enterprises. We've also seen a lot of regulatory studies in this area. So here are just a few examples for Canada and in Europe, also IOSCO, which is the international regulator in securities. And we've also seen legislative and rule reform. I wanted to just give you an example in the crypto exchange space or what we call crypto asset trading platforms. Our regulators have not really come across something like this before. Usually you have the exchange function, clearing, custody function, dealer function, all segregated. But with these things, they're all sort of merged into one. And so our regulators in a consultation paper issued in March said, in March of 2019 said, this is something new. Our laws were really never meant to deal with these things called crypto exchanges. And so they outlined a framework on how they should be regulated. And so uh, that framework was initially put out as a consultation paper, and they then received a number of comments back from stakeholders. And just a few months ago in March, about uh, two years after that consultation paper, they finally came out with what the path forward is for these crypto asset trading platforms. And then they also noted that for those platforms that are either domestic based or foreign based that are having Canadian users, you need to come in line with that framework and bring yourself forward by April 19th or else our regulators will potentially commence enforcement action. So that's been a big thing, which leads us to the next topic, which is securities litigation. We've seen a lot of um, activity involving ICOs. A famous one in Canada is a Plex coin, which is on the basis that these may have been illegal distributions of securities. These tokens that I was mentioning that are issued as part of an ICO, you may have heard of very uh, popular cases like Telegram, Kick. Ripple is currently being litigated in the courts. We've also seen a lot of cases involving crypto asset trading platforms or exchanges. A very famous one in Canada was Quadriga CX, where about 169 million was almost was lost by individuals who are using that platform. And the OSC came out with a report. They decided to exercise their prosecutorial discretion not to prosecute in that case because the founder who is at the heart of the fraud had passed away and also Quadriga had died a corporate death through a bankruptcy, but they issued a report, which I would commend upon you to, to read. It's a quite fascinating report. They're not findings of the OSC, they're findings of staff after their investigation. We had another really East interesting case in Canada involving a crypto fund that was litigated where our securities commission refused to receive a prospectus to allow the fund that would be consisting entirely of Bitcoins to allow the fund's units to be sold to retail investors. So the average mom and pop or uh, you know, lay investor. And that was the, the challenge um, in our, at our commission and it went up on appeal and the commission staff lost, meaning that the director was forced to receive that prospectus, meaning that Canada is now one of the first jurisdictions in the world to actually have what are called closed end funds um, where average investors can buy units of the fund and get direct exposure to Bitcoin. We also have number, a number of ETFs that have been authorized. And in the United States, these have been previously rejected for a number of reasons, including concerns over market manipulation, et cetera, et cetera. But a number of applications, including by Fidelity and Goldman Sachs, have now been presented to the SEC and they'll have to be, re they'll have to revisit this and query whether Canada's position and success with these will have an impact. So in terms of outstanding issues, um, the, a, a key issue in Canada and the United States remains over the legal classification of digital assets. Unlike some definition, some jurisdictions, as I understand it, like Singapore or others, where a definition of a security is very defined, uh, we have this thing called the investment contract test, where 
fortunately or unfortunately, reasonable people can reasonably disagree as to whether something, an asset, qualifies as a security. And so that debate continues to rage in Canada as to whether Bitcoin is a security, Ether is a security. The view is likely not, but there is no yet formal pronouncement which continues to be a blocker in this uh, area. So I'll cover in 30 seconds uh, anti-money laundering because I appreciate that my time is almost up. Um, and you, what you've I got a minute or two, Osman. Pardon me? You've got a minute or two, sir. Okay, good, thank you. So in terms of AML, our system in Canada is uh, the cornerstone piece of legislation is called the proceeds of crime legislation. And for quite some time, it was viewed to not capture things like virtual currencies. And to address that and to close that loop, in 2014, Canada amended that legislation to make it very clear that it would reach to those who are in the business of dealing in virtual currencies. And so that piece of legislation actually, to our knowledge, is the first piece of legislation in the world to really specifically address crypto assets. That being said, that amendment did not come into a force because it had to wait until certain regulations were adopted, which only occurred last year and this year. And so the definition of virtual currency is set out on your screen. It's a digital representation of value that can be used for payment or investment purposes um, or a private key relating to that. So it could probably apply to things like Bitcoin. It could apply to those ICO tokens that I was talking. It could apply to things called stable coins. Query whether what you may have heard of these NFTs or non-fungible tokens qualify under that. But if you are in the business of dealing in virtual currencies, a whole new regime now applies to you. And that includes requirements to register as a money service business, to keep certain records, to report suspicious activities, to comply with what's called the travel rule, where certain information from the sender needs to accompany that transaction to the recipient um, in, in, in Canada. Um, which has been a, an issue in the blockchain industry. And uh, what we've seen, just I guess a final point on AML is there's been a lot of developments at the international level. Back in June of 2019, FATF, which is an international organization that it doesn't really have legal, legal force in effect, but significant moral suasion in terms of how jurisdictions act, uh, set up their expectations as to how crypto or virtual asset uh, should be regulated from an AML perspective in each jurisdiction. And that has been what's been largely prompting and very much pushing what Canada has been doing in terms of the creation of a regime for virtual uh, virtual currency dealers and also uh, compliance regimes, et cetera, et cetera. And so the point really, then the thrust from this slide is to note that FATF at the international level has also been issuing guidance in this area for example, in September of 2020, certain red flag indicators, and they've also come out with a new public consultation um, trying to deal with the more uh, cutting edge elements of crypto assets, things like stable coins and DeFi or decentralized exchanges. A lot of the discussion there would re relate to these newer things that we're seeing in the blockchain industry. So the final point is, is that from my perspective as a formal regu regulator and now often helping blockchain companies out is, is that I've often told um, regulators that they really need to, in, when dealing with innovation, innovation has to have a helping hand. And that means that they need to be proactive in providing regulatory clarity. We, as I mentioned to this day in Canada and the United States, I would say do not have formal clarity as to the legal nature, legal classification of certain assets, which leads to a lot of other issues, which means how do you custody it if you don't know what it is or how to legally classify it? And there's many other follow on effects from the very basic inability to know what the legal status is of something like Bitcoin or some of these crypto assets. So we said that a critical thing and we've given some guidance to them on how they can achieve that clarity and some of the possible solutions are listed on this slide. We also said that there's better mechanisms that are required to facilitate dialogue with regulators. It is simply uneconomic for our clients 
to have to dialogue with regulators for years upon years on these novel issues. They simply cannot withstand the legal fees. And they not only have to de deal with the securities regulators, but also banking regulators and many, many other regulators in one jurisdiction, given the nature of their offering and the nature of blockchain technology itself, let alone given the transnational nature of the technology, the requirement to then dialogue with all other jurisdictions around the world. We also have noted to them that there is a requirement or they should turn their attention to trying to neutralize legislation to make it technologically agnostic. And we've seen examples of that. Some of them are noted on your slides where jurisdictions are turning their attention to whether the technology is fundamentally blocked based on our existing statutes. And so there's a lot of development in Canada and the United States on that front as well. On the enforcement side, we have very much pushed with our regulators that they have to engage in proper case selection. In other words, when a, a client of ours hears that they have come down with a heavy hand and a punitive hand against certain parties who are operating in the gray zone, that will push innovation away. And so our regulators have been encouraged to go after the clear frauds and to engage in guidance. And we've seen that approach being followed very much in Canada, United States. Um, so I guess I'll just end there and I'll move to questions and apologize for taking a little bit longer than expected, but um, I hope that that was helpful. Usman, that was an outstanding exposition. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate uh, those insights. And I know that uh, folks here on the call do. Uh, I have a number of questions coming in. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, so Kieran Walsh is asking, can we buy an exchange traded fund? And is that the safest way of trading because it's backed up by a finance house? Uh, <laughs> well, I try not to give investment advice over the phone, but um, so I would always say, and I encourage people to contact their own investment advisors and brokers as to what products they should get involved in or, or not get involved in. But I mean, I think what I, what I would say is this, is, is that at least the ETFs in Canada and there's other funds that are completely just solely one crypto asset. So these are apart from an ETF um, are available to investors. And the purpose of them is to allow an individual to get exposure um, without having to self custody the Bitcoin on their own digital wallet, whether it's on their phone or on their uh, computer or at a crypto exchange or what have you. So those products are available, but I would strongly encourage people to, you know, talk to their investment advisors and see whether these are in fact suitable for you, given your age and stage and financial means, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Bob McDowell asks, are regulators not nervous to opine as there remains a strong possibility that the legislature will put them back in their place and the judiciary may react negatively to regulatory innovation? So I missed the beginning part of this sentence. Can you just repeat that? You just broke up a little bit. Uh, uh, sorry, are regulators not nervous to opine as there remains a strong possibility that the legislature will put them back in their place and the judiciary may react negatively to regulatory innovation? Um, I think that from what I've been seeing with our regulators in Canada, the United States, and I go around the world speaking on this topic, is, is that there's a lot of concern from regulators, number one, to be the first mover. So that's the first thing not wanting to be either overly aggressive or under aggressive. And so I see a lot of tension at regulators not wanting to be the first mover and being able to look at guidance from this jurisdiction or that jurisdiction. Um, I don't know if there's necessarily a concern uh, with respect to dealing with legislature, le legislators or the courts. I mean, dealing with the courts, I mean, if a decision that is made by a regulator is going to be challenged, it's gonna be challenged one way or the other. And they will are prepared to accept that whether you're dealing with something in the blockchain space or whether one's dealing with anything in any of the traditional areas that we have seen. But our regulators, certainly the Ontario Securities Commission and others, would naturally be dialoguing with their legislators because they are a sort of an extension of our government as well. So I, I don't necessarily see their position as being too out of step from where our legislators would land. Um, so anyway, I hope that that's somewhat helpful. 
Thank you. Angus Wooler asks, can we really see cryptocurrencies sticking around over the next decade? It's surely a government's worst nightmare. I'm very skeptical on its future, and I wondered if you could enlighten me uh, on its future. So, if I had a crystal ball, I guess, um, and if I knew that crypto would have been at the height at which it is in the tens of thousands, I, I wish I would have known that a long time ago, and I would have uh, been a crypto billionaire of sorts. But in terms of its future, I mean, we see this coming up time and time again, which is where is it headed? Is this going to um, uh, die a quick death or what have you? As, as a lawyer in this space um, who deals with this area time and time again, I would be very, very reluctant to say that this industry is going anywhere. I mean, you will have seen the recent initial public offering for Coinbase where it had a valuation in the billions. Same thing with Chainalysis. They recently, which is a crypto forensic company, they recently closed a round of financing in the hundreds of millions, or actually in the billions. Same thing with a Canadian company called Dapper Labs, which is on the forefront of what are called non-fungible tokens. Uh, the famous NBA star Michael Jordan and many others recently invested in a round uh, which closed, I think it was three to four hundred million dollars. Um, so the, the, there's certainly a lot of startups in this area. Um, but when we talk about this industry, it is now filled with parties where think about the Internet in the early 19 or the late 1980s, early 1990s, where who knew that Amazon and Google would be as large as they currently are? Well, these giants are now emerging from the blockchain, blockchain industry, which is why I'm very reluctant to say that this industry is going anywhere or that it's going to die in death in a very near future. I can't see that happening, but that's just my own personal opinion. Thank you, Usman. Uh, Stephen Murgatroyd asks, can you update us on Facebook Libra? So I um, follow Facebook Libra from a distance and um, I'm aware of some aspects to them. Um, Facebook Libra's name was recently changed to DM. And I was recently talking actually to somebody very senior at BIS or the Bank of International Settlements who let me know that um, as it turns out, Facebook has, or, or I should say Libra or DM, have now moved from Switzerland back to the United States, uh, which was a quite fascinating thing for me to hear. So I have a, on my list of things to do to understand what was factoring into the consequentialist calculus as to why they decided to do that. But Facebook's project there, or I'll just call it DM for now, because Facebook is just one member among many on that council, is what I would say one of the critical developments in the blockchain space, and is one of the critical developments which I estimate is what is driving a lot of the development that we've been seeing on the CBDC front, on the central bank digital currency front. We've seen China as a major mover, We've seen statements from the U.S. Fed. We've seen the Bank of England come out with a number of reports and statements. IOSCO, uh, the Federal Reserve, many, many parties are, are uh, pushing these projects forward, largely and in part perhaps prompted because of projects like Facebook, Libra, or DM. Um, and so anyway, th those are my, that's my understanding, but it seems like from what I've been hearing, rumor has it that they are looking to launch a version of their product sometime this year, which will be, for, again, in my, in my view, a game changer in this area. Thank you. And talking of China, Fabian Bresco asks, do you see other countries blocking crypto transactions like what happened in China? So... There's um, statements on blocking transactions, and then there's the ability to actually block transactions, which is a very different thing um, because of the nature of public blockchains. They're so decentralized that it's difficult to figure out how to shut something down or what have you. So my understanding uh, with respect to China is, is that the China has 
from my recollection, back in 2017, has taken a position against crypto and has banned crypto. And I remember that that was back in August or September of 2017 when they were making those statements. From my understanding, is, is that really what they've been targeting now, in addition to sort of repeating their earlier statement, is also directing their critical sites towards crypto miners. And so in China, you have the largest group of crypto miners supporting the Bitcoin protocol, is my understanding. And we have now been fielding <laughs> quite a number of calls from uh, Chinese companies or miners that are looking to exit China. And oftentimes Canada is destination number one or two because for crypto mining operations, it is good to be in a cold climate because the cold climate will naturally cool down the computers versus having to expend energy and further, and also our energy is cheap. And so uh, in terms of your question as to whether I see other countries banning um, I haven't seen those efforts being made as of yet, and I query as to how that can happen um, in terms of transactions, but certainly moving against crypto miners and shutting down a crypto mining operation as in a bricks and mortars um, operation, I can see how that can happen. But I haven't seen too much on that front, but I don't profess to know everything that's happening in every country. Thank you, Esmond. Sam Azad asks, have you reviewed the Polonex matter? And do you have any comments in relation to whether crypto related services can be offered to Canadian residents on the basis of reverse solicitation? So just to give everybody a little bit of background, what the um, uh, questioner is asking is in relation to Polonex, which is a rather large uh, crypto asset trading platform um, that uh, was recently uh, hit with a, what's called a statement of allegations. Think of it as charges in Canada by our securities regulator. And so this is really, um, I won't specifically comment on that given case, if you don't mind, um, uh, because we have a very active litigation group and we have clients with different positions in relation to the issues that are raised in that statement of allegations. But I think what our regulators have been clear about is, is that the way in which crypto asset trading platforms have created, particularly what are called custodial exchanges, although I'm not supposed to use that word, um, the way that these are operating is in a manner that is very much triggering securities laws in Canada. And therefore, if you are a domestic Canadian crypto exchange or crypto asset trading platform, or if you are one that is based in Timbuktu, uh, some foreign city, some foreign nation, but happen to have a nexus to Canada, either because you have uh, users in Canada or you have um, uh, employees in Canada or servers in Canada, then we have a Canadian securities law issue. Um, so I do expect our regulators uh, to and I, I do understand that there's a number of investigations involving many other foreign-based crypto asset trading platforms. So I, I see the Polonia X matter as just the tip of the iceberg here. Thank you. Um, another question here. I believe that whilst it should be achievable in theory, especially if a defendant keeps all its assets in a cryptocurrency rather than the bank account, it may not be feasible in practice to apply to a court for an injunction to a freeze and uh, a defendant's crypto wallets in civil proceedings. Um, I don't know if that's a comment that you would agree with. Uh, so I do a lot of litigation as well. I help out on solicitor matters and I help out on litigation matters as well. And the, the point that is being made by the questioner is an excellent one. Um, which is, is that our regulators and our courts haven't really seen something like crypto assets before, digital wallets, crypto exchanges or trading platforms, crypto custodians, and query whether, and this is a very vibrant debate currently in Canada, the United States, as to whether our existing tools are sufficient from a enforcement perspective or a civil litigation perspective to be able to address what is happening. So the questioner is quite right. How do you enjoin, how do you freeze an account um, 
uh, or prevent something from happening when you don't even know uh, uh, who is behind the the crypto wallet. Um, so a Bitcoin, as I was explaining before, is a ledger. It's what we call pseudo and anonymous, meaning that we can see all the transactions, but we don't know who's behind them. We can see a public address, but we don't know who's behind them. And I've had many cases trying to get injunctions against parties, particularly involving one case involving an executive who ran away with $20 million, where that was a struggle. And we managed to find the individual and get a court order in that particular case, but uh, it required a lot of creative thinking. So I, I think that the question, or at least the comment, is an excellent one. Very good, thank you. Well, we are very close to uh, the end of the session. Uh, I've got a further comment here from Bob McDowell. Much of the litigation in the cryptocurrency space is as speculative as some of the cryptocurrencies. The judiciary is extremely cautious about extending case law in this space, which continues to provide business uncertainty. Is that how you observe it? Well, I mean, to the point about the judiciary being cautious about giving, um, in Canada, what's happening is, is that the courts have to deal with these issues, whether they like it or not. And so if an application or a cause of that or a statement of claim is brought and the matter has to proceed to court and has to proceed to determination, they will have to grapple with it. And that being said, our courts have in their decisions have said, like, look, we need expert evidence. We need to better understand um, what's going on here. But to the point about there being still uncertainty and business uncertainty because of the lack of decisions or the lack of guidance in certain areas. Yes, absolutely. We are seeing that day in, day out. And I'm not sure if I uh, feel like anybody is to wrong be, is in the wrong about that, because welcome to innovation. I do a lot in the artificial intelligence space, syntax space. I mean, in artificial intelligence, we're still struggling to figure out what's the definition of artificial intelligence. So these types of issues are really nothing new when we talk about innovation or emerging tech. But you're quite right. I mean, we I don't need to go on endlessly about this matter, but many people believe that Satoshi Nakamoto decided to conceal his, her, their identity because of the regulatory uncertainty. And because if their name was revealed, they would be a single point of failure on the Bitcoin protocol. In other words, if the Silk Road prosecution was going on in the very early days, Satoshi Nakamoto would almost certainly have been brought in as uh, potentially aiding and abetting that enterprise. Same thing here in Canada. In our Toronto office, just two streets away from us was invented Ethereum, the second largest blockchain protocol. Those folks ended up picking up and leaving. <laughs> and we represent some of the co-founders of Ethereum. Uh, they ended up moving to Switzerland because there was a search for regulatory certainty, uh, which was not present at the time in Canada and some query whether it's still present or not. Um, but I think it's an excellent point and an excellent question. And probably the last question on related question stroke point from Alex Powell. He makes the point, who do you litigate if there's a problem with the ledger or the code around it rather than the problem with the asset itself, especially in a trustless environment? <laughs> well, I don't want to um, uh, cause you to fall off your chair, but what happens even further if you're dealing with what's called a DAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization? Think of a corporation that is run entirely of smart contracts with no humanoid behind the entity itself. And this is not a theoretical debate, this is an actual debate because the very first and major prosecution uh, or guidance document that was issued by the United States Securities and Exchange Commission is widely referred to as the Dow Report. And they were looking at whether there were US federal securities law violations involving a Dow, which happened to be called a Dow, it's almost like an internet company calling themselves the internet. But anyway, this was a DAO that was, as determined by the SEC, um, effectively violating US securities laws. And so I would recommend that you take a look at that report. Just type into Google SEC DAO report and see how the SEC approached it. Uh, but you're quite right. I mean, in that case, not only did they look at the DAO itself, which they determined was an unincorporated association, they also looked at the developers, which was Slockit. They looked at what were called curators, 
and they tried to extend the liability using existing provisions under federal securities laws to do that. Another interesting case to look at is called EtherDelta, which is a decentralized exchange or what's called a DEX. And you can see that the SEC ended up prosecuting, even though the DEX itself called EtherDelta was violating US federal securities laws, likely by being a national securities exchange without being registered, they went after Zach Colburn, who was the founder of the exchange. And it continued to have some role, even though pretty much everything was being done just by smart contracts. So it's an interesting question. And I, I'll just end with this. It's a lot of these hypothetical or theoretical issues that we often see pop up in artificial intelligence, which is what happens when the driverless car kills, um, are coming live and, cent and front and center in the blockchain space. And we're dealing with these on a daily basis, which is why many of us are so fascinated and happen to be in this area. Uh, there's really not a day that goes by where there's not something new and novel that comes up. So with that, I'll pass it back to you. you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, and artificial intelligence bots listening in, that uh, brings <laughs> us to the end of our session. Uh, I would like to thank the sponsors uh, for generously supporting our program and making these sessions uh, available. I would like to thank the audience for uh, no doubt intensive, attentive listening and certainly some great questions. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, we have some upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow there is an outstanding event for those of us in Europe uh, looking at the city's dominance in European finance uh, in terms of uh, the impact of Brexit. There's another session on Monday creating a knowledge city. I commend all those to you. And Usman, thank you for a truly engaging session. I've received lots of comments in the chat bar, thanking you for such an outstanding presentation. Uh, no and problem. with that, um, I will bring proceedings to a close. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for having me.